most appropriate today is found in Romans, the 15th chapter, the 13th verse. May the God of joy fill you with all joy as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm, amen. I want you to pretend that this is the Christian just like you. And you are full of joy. There's lots of songs about joy. And one of them is, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, whoopee, so very happy, oh boy. I got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, wow, so very happy. I have the love of Jesus in my heart. Now that didn't sound very joyful, did it? Here we're full of all this joy, and we're not experiencing our joy. And boys and girls, there's a lot of Christians walk around every day and they go, I love the Lord. I'm supposed to be full of joy. What's the matter? Well, you know, we were singing, I'm so happy, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Well, happiness can get confused with joy. Happy is kind of a selfish feeling in a way. I, 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 happy, happy, happy. And we're not supposed to contain, like this container, our joy. We're supposed to give it to others. So in order for our joy to be full, we have to open it 
it up and give it to others. And there is another song about that. I got a railroad life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Open prison doors, that's the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me to praise up for oh well within my soul. Spring up for oh well and make me whole. Spring up for oh well and give to me that life abundantly. It's not working. Why is it not working? I'm supposed to have a big fountain of joy. Let me see if I'm doing something wrong. Let's go back to the verse. May the God of joy fill you with all joy as you trust in him so that you may overflow with joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ah, a lot of us forget it's not in our own power that we're able to give joy. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's add a little Holy Spirit. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Oh, spring up, oh well, and give to me my life abundantly. This is what the Lord wants you to share. That abundant life, that joy he has given to you, only works when you pass it on to others. Let's pray. Lord, you bless us every day, but we're not supposed to hold on to it. We're supposed to pass that blessing along to others. May we always be a spring of joy to everyone we meet. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, now it's time for some church news. I'll let you know that we are uh, live now on the pastor's patio. So if any of you would like to join us on Sunday morning, um, instead of being at home, if you want to come for the, on your real life, um, we're out there on the patio, so a big wave to everybody on the patio this morning. Um, also, if you have not um, let the church know what your email is, um, the, the uh, sermon reflection questions and the bulletin are available to you. You'll just let us know what your email is so we can send that to you before the service. Um, it's, of course, on the live feed for uh, FaceTime, but we also want you to know that you can receive your own personal copy through the uh, email. So get those emails into the church if you haven't already done so. Um, uh, that leads me into uh, an invi personal invitation to everybody to come on Monday um, evenings at 6.30. Uh, we have a Zoom meeting going on that we go over the questions and reflections of the sermon. Um, and we've really been enjoying it. We've got a small group of us doing it. We'd love to have more people come in and join us. Uh, I, I personally have found it very uh, um, um, beneficial to, to not just hear the sermon and hear the scripture one time, but to really dig into it. So um, if you'd like to join us on that Zoom meeting, please um, uh, let me know what your email is, and I'll email you that invitation, and you can join us for that discussion. It's been really fun. We are one week behind, so tomorrow we will be discussing last week's sermon and questions. We'd like to give ourselves plenty of time to reflect on all those questions. Um, we also, on Tuesday, um, the women's group that usually meets in the morning is now going to meet at 1 o'clock in the afternoon over in the Wesley patio. So please, all women are invited to come and join that meeting um, on this coming month's Tuesday um, at 1 o'clock on the patio. A men's group is also meeting um, at this time in the pastor's patio at 6.30. Um, and they started a new study just this last week on the studies on the Sermon on the Mount. So we, and all men are invited to that meeting as well. So um, come and fellowship with both of those times. We also have the healing rooms that are open. Um, everyone needs to know that on Thursdays um, from five to seven. And if you can't make it into the actual physical healing room, then you can go ahead and email your name and um, email to ccf.healingroomrooms um, at gmail.com um, for an appointment, and then they'll hook you up with some people who would be loving to pray for you. So just know that those things are going on. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Okay, and now it's, we're moving into a time of our offering. Um, we're just reminding you that you can 
Um, there are many ways that you can get your offering to the church. You can come see Diana and her smiling face um, in the church office um, and bring your offering there. You can also um, snail mail it in or you can um, make arrangements with Diana to have that online um, um, de direct deposit made um, for, um, for your offering. So, Lord uh, Jehovah Jireh, Father God Almighty, we just um, come to you today um, with a grateful heart for all that you provide to us. We ask that you would um, be in our offering. We ask that you would give us eyes to see and a heart to know when you have given us more than what we need. And you do that so often. Help us to see that we have all that we need in you. you know, guide us in our receiving Guide us in our giving. And um, we ask that you would bless and protect the offering today, that you would, it would be pleasing in your sight. In your son's name we do pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Again, we lift up our voices and sing to our Lord and Savior Jesus. Your love is devoted. Your praises will ever be on.
We think of our family members who are in the hospital. We thank you for those who were there and have come home. We ask that you be with those who remain and need a touch of hope and healing from you. We thank you, Lord, that we live in a world where others will step out in care for those in need. We thank you for the firefighters in Northern California doing just that. And we ask that you bless them, watch over them, as well as watch over those who watch their homes burn. Protection, Lord. We thank you for your protection. We ask that in that situation. But we also, Lord, know that it makes it on the news here, but there's so many places where your people are in harm's way. We think about those who step out in places where they know they're going to be persecuted and they're willing to say words of love anyway. And Lord, we ask that you walk with them and be their comfort. Lord, we would ask that you, by your example, by the examples of other believers, by speaking to our own hearts and minds, that you would turn these bodies into a greater reflection of your love. You said that we would be a temple for you. We ask that you glorify your name through how you teach us to live. We are ready, Lord, submitted to you to hear from you. And in that spirit, Lord, we join together across the time, across the, all these homes as we watch. Time and space is not a restriction to you. We just say, unite us, Lord, because we are your children. And we pray together as your children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture starts off with a startling first sentence. The scene right before our reading is the martyrdom of Stephen. The last scene is Stephen just before his death, looking to heaven, having the heavens open, knowing that despite what's happening around him, there was a peace and a countenance on him that didn't care, in a sense, of what was about to happen. That itself irritated those watching as he was received into heaven by his Lord. That's the scene right before we hear these words. We give you thanks, Father, for your scriptures. Give us the ears to hear what you would have each one of us hear in the scripture this morning. Verse 5. And Saul approved their killing of him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. In chapter 9 in Acts. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice to say, saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, 
but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my choice of instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me, I'll think it through, <laughs> has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something fell like scales from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Going on to a reading in Romans 1, 1 through 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Cindy. So Lord, as we step into your word, we ask that you speak to each one of us. Whatever comes out of my mouth, Lord, we ask that it lead us to you and that your spirit minister to each one of us and we know you're able and we thank you for that Lord in Jesus name amen so we'll get to the scriptures in a second but I want to give you a little hint about what we're going for today I have come under the distinct impression that a few of the people who I know and love as Christians are still working their tail off to try to earn you hear me to try to earn the gift of salvation, to try to earn God's blessing, to try to earn God's love. If you were in the room, I'd ask you, how's that going for you? My suspicion is, the more you work, the more you feel like you're not making the grade. I can relate to that, because that's exactly how my mental programming is. I grew up, so I've got the firstborn disease, um, caretaking for my brothers, all kinds of things like that. If I didn't have straight A's, it was a failure. And what was worse, okay, this is just a, I don't know if my mom and dad are watching, but um, my brother, second born, struggled with grades. If he got a C, he got paid. If he got a B, he really got paid. And once in a while when he got an A, oh my goodness, to talk about wealth, straight A's, nothing. Now I couldn't draw worth a darn. I wish I had some of his artistry, but I was jealous because he got 
recognized and paid for whatever grade he got. Me? It's just expected. Well, that became a feature of who I am, where I felt like whatever was seen had to measure up and there was no room for error. I, in 10th grade, I'm not going to stay long with this because Mike and Joe have to go teach Sunday school at some time on Zoom. So if you guys are late, tell the kids I'm sorry. But in, in 10th grade, I was taking Spanish. And first semester, I was doing okay, but I was having to work at it. And I was actually learning Spanish. And I actually enjoyed it. But at the end of the first semester, the teacher gave me a B. And he said, I want you to work harder, so I'm only going to give you a B. And I looked at my average, and I averaged an A. A minus, but it was an A. From that point on, I got straight A's in Spanish and didn't learn a thing. I knew and I know how to perform to get the grade. Problem is, we tend to do that in our relationship with God. And it doesn't work. Because we never have one thing to add to the grace that he's given us in Christ. It's not up to us to, okay, I'm saved, now I'm going to earn it. Okay, I know he died on the cross for me, now I'm going to show you how much I deserve. In our passage, we have somebody who grew up. Everything about him was spot on. We read about Paul in, in uh, Philippians, the third chapter of Philippians. He talks about, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was in the tribe of Benjamin. I was, grew up as a Pharisee. I was trained. Even, he says to, in one of the times when he's testifying, I was way above and beyond my age and status. I was trained by Gamaliel, one of the uh, well-known Pharisee. I was on the way. And as for zeal for the law, I was perfect in my adherence to the law. And I honored that so much, I was a, went after that church, that those believers calling the way, because I knew that what they were following in that person that we had crucified was a lie. I was there. I had actually voted for the execution of Stephen. And I was there. I was the one where the coats were put at my feet. He says in one of his trials that I voted regularly for that. To stop that blasphemy. Paul. Stephen has just died. Paul's close. He's a young man, but he's part of the power. Maybe finally we can silence this. Okay, fellow leaders of the temple, give me the order and I'll go arrest the rest of them. And Paul is doing that. He is going door to door, dragging people out, sending them to prison. Probably including if you don't repent, there's an execution wait. In the movie, Paul where it depicts him in prison as an old man and Luke is coming to interview him and it gives us sort of a picture of how Luke would have come to understand what he knew to put in the book of Acts as he wrote it. You see Paul with nightmares. It's a recurring thing in that, in that movie. Those nightmares are the faces of women, men, and children who he sent into persecution. It doesn't say it, but the movie suggests that, that those nightmares could be the thorn that torments him, his earthly life. Certainly knowing what he had done before coming to salvation, many of us know that there's room for regret in those years. But I'm struck too, last week in the reading, he says, I don't judge myself and my conscience is clear. I'm not perfect. Only God, only Christ can judge. 
Nothing should be judged until the proper time. And if he says in Romans, if Christ, who can judge me, died for me, what does that do about those sins? He gets there. Do you think he earns? Do you think he earns that declaration of faith? No. He receives it. He didn't achieve it. He just receives it. He is full bore going against the people of God. On his way to Damascus. Ready to do what he's done in Jerusalem. Drag people out of their homes. Get them to talk. Find out who else he can throw in prison. And he's got guards with him. And they're ready. And boom. He's knocked off his horse. Possibly unconscious. We know he can't see for three days. He hears a voice. The guards don't hear what he's hearing, but they know something's happening. I mean, the caravan stops what's going on. They have to help him into Damascus. And in that moment, this persecutor of the church hears from his, from his Lord that he didn't know was his Lord yet. Now, mind you, later he talks about all the prophets and the word of God pointing to the Messiah. He knows the scriptures. He knows what's coming. He just didn't believe that this was the one. He says, Lord, who are you? As the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. When you persecute all these, you're persecuting me. Goes on into Damascus. He's there for a few days, blind. God help Ananias. All we know about Ananias is this story. So somewhere prior to this, Ananias had heard the message about Jesus, had turned his life over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and was willing here's the scary part, was willing to listen to what the Holy Spirit told him to do. I love it. Lord, we've heard about this guy, Saul. Now, mind you, Saul is his more Hebrew name. Paul is more Greek name. He doesn't actually start being called Paul until about chapter 12 of Acts. Luke reminds us that it's the same person. So the scriptures we're reading says Saul reinforcing the fact that he's coming out of a full-on Jewish background. This man, Saul, is persecuting your people. You want me to go talk to him? Uh-uh. And where would we be had Ananias said no? Think about that for a second. Because I guarantee you that there's somebody in your life for whom you are Ananias for whom the Lord wants you to go be vulnerable and say, there's a love here for you. Salvation, hope, overcoming. I've been where you are, lost. But God loves you and has something for you. Ananias shares the message from the Lord to Paul. You are going to be my messenger to the Gentiles. Okay, ask you again, what did Paul do to earn the salvation and forgiveness, to earn the commissioning, and to earn having a message to share? I'm waiting. You're right. Absolutely nothing. That's true for every one of us. It starts by receiving this gift of grace. Paul will later describe in Romans, a reading from Romans, that he received the grace and the call from Christ, from God, and that we all in the same way, receive 
this call. And he's speaking to the Roman Gentiles, saying, this call is coming from God to say to you who once were far off, come on in. Be part of this love. And that's speaking to an audience that from a previous understanding, even Paul's previous behavior, were an unacceptable group of people. They can't come in here because they don't follow all the rules. Paul's an amazing ambassador for this Gentile mission because he knew every rule. Every time we talk about Pharisees in the Gospels, Paul would have known everything that those Pharisees or the scribes would have thought. And he had to let that be set aside so that he could offer this message of hope and redemption. I'm going to tell you a story. We don't always know what we say and how it's going to affect us or how it's going to affect our audience. But we are, as God's children, we are always on this mission. So I was hearing from a couple missionaries this week. Walcott is the last name. I can't think of his first name. Steve, maybe. He described going on a hunting trip. He wasn't going in his missionary job at this particular point. He's been a missionary in Africa for 40 years or so, and he was hunting with, at the time, they were called pygmies, now they're the Efe, which is their tribal name. And they were hunting. They were hum hunting monkeys. And they shot a couple monkeys that got stuck in the tree. And he describes this as being like 200 feet or more up in the air, and they're stuck. And he wonders what they're going to do. And he's just there on a hunting party. And all of a sudden, He's standing there alone in the jungle wondering, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? Where'd they go? Lord, are they going to come back and get me? Well, they had gone to get their vines, what they were using for ropes, vines. And they pulled down one small tree, use it to create leverage, pull down another tree, and they start tying those together, pull down another tree, and pretty soon they built this bridge up 200 feet in the, row, in the air using their vines as a rope, and they retrieve their prize. Then they come down untying the rope and they go back to the village and they eat. Somewhere in the course of the evening, he talks about a different bridge. He says, well, you know, the way you guys did that bridge, that's what Jesus does for us. He came, he died, he gave himself so there might be a bridge for us to have forgiveness of our sins and to know that we're loved by the Father. He left. That was just sort of an off-the-hand sharing. Again, he wasn't there to preach. He didn't have an invitation to preach. He just told the story at the campfire. Forgot about it. 22 years later, he bumps into a young man who says, you won't remember me, but... And the young man recounts that story around that evening meal in the village. As a result of that, me and my family, we all became Christians, and we call on the name of the Lord. And our whole tribe become, became Christian, and we call on the name of the Lord because of that story. We are bearers of a story of hope, and like Ananias, we're supposed to be ready to just say, okay, I see you, I know you, I recognize what you're struggling with, I see the reality of your life, but here's something I want you to know from God. Ananias may not have known what Paul became. Paul lets us know that he goes out into Arabia for a while, and then he's up in northern Syria, Turkey for a while, and it's 14 years later when Barnabas comes and gets him and brings him to Antioch, and he starts working for the Lord don't know if Ananias was still alive. Would Ananias have known what Paul became for the Lord? We don't necessarily know what the Lord is going to do with our willingness to share. But he asks us to share. 
So, back to the point. Here's a person who is dead set on doing everything he can to oppose the Lord. The Lord still loves, the Lord still calls, the Lord still equips, the Lord still uses, and the Lord still graces. The wife of the person I just told you about with the hunting story, she works in the Central Republic of the Congo, where there's currently a civil war going on. The war is being fostered by countries around, and there's a religious element where Christians in particular are being persecuted, churches burned, families suffering from death. She realized that if that there is going to be ministry in this area, the trauma that all the folks needed to be addressed. And she took a training, not a mental health training, but a biblical, gentle, there's no medication, there's no trained psychiatrist. The, the, the program itself was overseen by, by mental health professionals, but there's no room for that where she is. And they started training folks to talk about trauma and help people come out from under trauma. And the crazy thing is, they said anyone who wants to learn how to help, come. And mental health workers, community health workers who were Muslim also came. And they didn't say, you can't come, this is only for Christians. They warned that we we're going to talk about Jesus, and they said, because we believe that Jesus is the only person who has said, I can heal, and has demonstrated that out of all the different religions there are. Just so no, we're going to talk about Jesus, but you're welcome to come. So here they are, Christians, probably some non-Christian atheist types, and Muslims are together learning about trauma and, and about how to help people feel loved after trauma. Christian mission, Christian guidelines, Christian purpose. They honored prayer time for the Muslim brothers. It was Ramadan. They said, we understand whatever you need to do. Do what you need to do, but stay with us. By the end of it, they describe one person who was Muslim saying, I don't know what to do with my religion, but I know I love Jesus, and I'm going to have to keep loving him. He actually went home and asked his wife, who had converted out of Christianity into Islam, for them to get married. He said, you used to have a Bible, where is it? He went and started reading the Bible that his wife still had somewhere. Another man, as the training was coming to an end, stood up and just was pounding his heart, and he said, I never knew what it was to be loved. She says, you know, when you offer this love, it gets messy. You don't know what's going to happen with your effort. I think of Ananias. Yes, Lord, I hear you. Yes, Lord, you're telling me to go. Yes, Lord, he might throw me in jail. Okay, I'll go. She says, it gets messy. But you have to keep loving. I was listening to one preacher this week who described the grace. Our sins have been washed. There's nothing we can do to add to our worthiness of what was done on the cross. There's nothing that we can do to add to what was done for us on the cross. We stand redeemed because of the cross. Where grace comes in is helping us to move forward in the new truth that we live into. We have an identity. We have a calling. We have a purpose that God is asking us to step out into. Paul literally says that 
God set him apart from earth. So he literally gives God credit for preparing him. All of what he knew about the law, all of what he knew growing up, all of what he went through in becoming this zealot against the word of God, all of that was part of God's design. He called me from before I was born. I'm sure he was thinking about Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Or he was thinking about Jeremiah's call, or Isaiah's call, or any of the other Samuel's call. Each of us, each of us have been called not because we ever deserved anything. Not because we had made the grade. Not because we had measured up. But because God loves us and has bubbling over love. Oh, and by the way, he loves us some more. And oh, he loves us even more than you started to imagine that he might love you if only you could. And then there's some love that's even more. And when we get a hold of that love, and we realized that, like the bottle, fortunately, it's trustees, it didn't spill on the carpet. <laughs> like that 7-Up bottle, it's just more than can, we can contain. Then, there's somebody near us who needs it. Lord, I would ask that you help each one of us. Each one of us come into a closer understanding of how much we are loved, how much we are called, how much we are chosen, where we still want to say, yes, but what about this part of who I am? How can you love me through this? Or what about this that I did? How can you still love me? What about this way that I still separate myself from you? Lord, help us to receive the gift of love, salvation, and grace to push those things away so that we can stand in your presence and know who we really are. And then out of that truth, speak who you really are to others so that they can know this love as well. Thank you.
show you what he's done for you and let him show you what he needs you to perhaps filter out so that you can receive more and give more. Lord, lead each one of us in these moments, in the moments that follow this day as we come before you tonight in our prayers Wherever it is, Lord, help us to see ourselves how you see us. Help us to receive that call that you have made to each one of us individually that reminds us that we are loved. And through that love, gives us love to share with abundance. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you that your love is so great and glorious. Great is thy faith.
confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Lord, we want you. Help us to get out of the way so that you live in us and we feel the fullness of what that means. God bless you all. Go in peace. Amen.